What's going on everybody? It's Warren. Welcome back to the Cosmic Wonder and Loki episode 5 was truly amazing. And it left us with a lot to think about including a lot more Kang the Conqueror easter eggs. But will Kang be revealed in the Loki series? We know he's confirmed to be coming in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania played by Jonathan Majors. But is Kang the person hiding in that castle that Loki and Sylvie are about to infiltrate? Or is it King Loki? After all the show is about different variants of Loki, it would kind of make sense if in the finale, the person behind it all was actually Loki himself. After all, that is what Loki is typically about. Ruling, conquering. Perhaps one version of Loki, instead of just trying to conquer Earth, conquered the entire timeline and multiverse. However, like I said, we do have a lot more Easter eggs for Kang the Conqueror in this episode. And this is going to be my ending explained and full breakdown of Loki episode 5, Journey Journey into mystery. And if you love the Loki series so far and the MCU, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of the latest videos. So we'll go ahead and start with the ending explained because I know a lot of people are wondering about this and then we'll talk about who could be inside of that mysterious castle. Then I'll do a breakdown of the extremely important events that happened in this episode that you need to know. So with the ending explained, as we start off episode 5, Ravona Renslayer explains that when they prune a reality or a person, it's impossible to get rid of all of their matter. So instead, they move it to a place on the timeline where it won't continue growing. So when they were resetting timelines throughout the Loki series, they weren't actually resetting timelines. They were simply moving the timelines, transferring them. And they transfer it to a void at the end of time, where every instance of existence collides at the same point and simply stops. Now, Sylvie asks why it stops, but Ravona says she doesn't know. However, this is revealed to us by the Lokis. As we go to the void where Loki was sent after he was pruned and other Lokis before him, we learn about the entity Eliath. And Eliath has the job of permanently deleting everybody. So all of the different timelines that get pruned and all of the different people that get pruned, Eliath permanently gets rid of them. And this is why everything comes to an end. But Sylvie asks, what if you go beyond the void? Judge Renslayer says that the void is the end of time and that the timekeepers were supposedly writing the end of time. So the void is as far as you can go. But Sylvie thinks that you could push past it because she believes that if you go past it, that's where the person who created the TVA will be be. So her plan is to get past Eliath. So she prunes herself and she ends up in the void. She meets up with Loki and the other Lokis and says that her plan is to enchant it because when she first arrived in the void, she made contact with Eliath and connected with it, leading her to believe that she could enchant it and then essentially remove it out of her way and find out who's behind everything. So that is exactly what happens. With the help of classic Loki, a dagger from Kid Loki, and help from our main man Tom Hiddleston Loki himself, Sylvie and Loki together were able to enchant Eliath. And once they enchanted Eliath, they removed Eliath out of the picture, revealing a castle that looks to be in the middle of the universe. Now, this was actually revealed to us in a previous Loki trailer. You just had to look really, really closely. New Rockstars pointed out that if you took a look at this donut-shaped rock, on top of it, you could see sort of a golden yellow light. We see the same golden yellow light in the castle that is revealed at the end of episode 5. The castle has a tower and at the top of that tower is a golden yellow light. And if you look at the background, there is a very, very bright white line. This is also found in the other shot as well, and this is most likely the sacred timeline. And this castle is most likely at the end of time. And whoever is so-called writing time or finishing the timeline is in this castle, living right at the end of time. And in episode 6, the finale, Sylvie and Loki are going to confront this person. And now, of course, the big question is, who is there? And as I mentioned before in the beginning, at this point, we've narrowed it down to pretty much two options. Kang the Conqueror or King Loki, a different variant of Loki. Now, there have been many Easter eggs and references to Kang the Conqueror all throughout the Loki series. And keep in mind that Kang the Conqueror is confirmed to be coming in the movie Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. So it is confirmed that his character is going to be introduced into the MCU soon. Perhaps he could make his debut in Loki because in the comics, King the Conqueror is from the future and is a master of time travel. He would use his time travel devices and go on to conquer many different timelines, taking on the name King.
Kang the Conqueror, but his real name is Nathaniel Richards, believed to be a descendant of Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. Kang the Conqueror in the comics is directly connected with the three timekeepers. The three timekeepers actually seek out Kang. When they make it to the end of time, they discover that they are the only three people left. So they go back to time to Kang and they make him an offer. Instead of conquering different timelines, he could save them. And in return, they would grant him immortality. Kang accepts the deal and he rebrands himself as Immortus. Obviously, the three timekeepers existing at the end of time are in Loki. Also, not to mention the void in Loki, where everything kind of goes to die at the end of time, is sort of a limbo. And in the comics, that is the dimension where Kang dwells, in a limbo dimension that sort of exists outside of time. There is his base, Chronopolis. And this could be the castle that we are seeing in Loki. They could have just rebranded it a little bit from the comics instead of it being an entire city, it's just a castle. Then, not to mention there is a really specific easter egg at 3 minutes into Loki episode 5. You can see the old Avengers tower on the right, but instead of saying Stark or Avengers, it says Q E N G. And if you pronounce that, it actually does sound kind of like Kang. However, this is an actual company, and get this, Kang himself actually owns this company. Kang the Conqueror finds himself displaced in time and stuck in the 21st century. So while he's stuck there, he decides to make the best of it. Taking on the name of Mr. Gryphon, he buys the Stark Tower from Tony Stark, and the company that he owns is Q-E-N-G, and he puts it on the side. This is what we are seeing here. This is a direct Easter egg to Nathaniel Richards, aka Kang. So a huge Easter egg here, and not to mention Ravona Renslayer, or Judge Renslayer, who has been in the Loki series since episode one, is Kang's lover in the comics. So there are just a ton of Easter eggs pointing towards Kang the Conqueror. However, the series is the Loki series. It's focused on Loki, and it wouldn't be a surprise to me at all if that, at the end, it was Loki behind it all. It was Loki all along. Loki has always wanted to rule, and as as he mentioned in the beginning of the series, he would rule to make it easier for people. And like he said in the first Avengers film, is this not simpler? So it is entirely in Loki's nature to somehow manage to get a hold of a sacred timeline and kind of do with it what he wants and feels is best. And in the comics, there is actually a King Loki, which is a future Loki. And long story short, he kind of decides to do things on his own and make destiny what he believes it should be. And that has been a reoccurring theme in the series. Loki has struggled with destiny and fate when Mobius told him that he dies by Thanos every time because that is what's supposed to happen. Loki has a big problem with this because Loki wants to create his own future and that could be what a variant of Loki did. So we've narrowed it down to a King Loki or Kang. Now, what could happen is that it could be Loki, but Loki could be working for Kang and Kang could be the next Thanos. And just like Loki in our main timeline was working for Thanos, it could be the same thing here, but this Loki could be working for Kang. Or perhaps they could throw us off and it could be He Who Remains. He Who Remains in the comics is the final director of the Time Variance Authority and he exists at the Citadel at the end of time, the last reality of the multiverse. And it's pretty clear that this castle exists at the end of time, although I don't think it's He Who Remains, but they could throw us a curveball. So at this point in time, I'm betting that it's Kang or Loki. And be sure to let me know who you think it is in the comments down below. And now let's break down these key moments of what happened in episode 5, Journey into Mystery. Now we start off by being reminded what happened at the end of Loki episode 4. We see one of the fake timekeeper's heads on the floor. We know that Loki got pruned and Mobius got pruned, but we know that Loki didn't actually die. And from here we get a glimpse of the city that he is in. It is a broken down, destroyed city, and it starts to zoom in on Loki from afar, kind of taking us through the city. Here we see the Avengers Tower that has Q-E-N-G on it. And then we finally arrive to Loki and the other Lokis and there's a bus on the left. And we can see a name on the bus and that name is Callum Ross. And Callum Ross is actually an editor for the Loki series. So a tiny little Easter egg there. Here, Loki asks the other Lokis three questions. What is this place? Where are we? Who are you? 
in which classic Loki replies, this is the void, that's Eliath, and where is lunch? Now, as I mentioned before, Renslayer explained that timelines that are reset are actually just transferred. Same with people that are pruned. From there, Eliath permanently destroys them. In fact, it's the very next scene where she explains this to Sylvie. And she says that she actually wants to know who is behind the TVA because she claims to not know as well, and she claims that they lied to her. Although this is kind of hard to believe because she wasn't really that shocked when she found out that the timekeepers were androids. So it definitely seemed like she knew. But meanwhile, Loki is traveling with the other Lokis trying to escape Eliath, and they basically explain the same thing that Ravona says. Everything the TVA prunes ends up there at that void. Entire branched timelines end up there and get devoured by Eliath in an instant. And their job right now is essentially to stay alive. From here, it's revealed that that alligator is indeed a Loki variant, which Loki accepts pretty easily because why not? But he wonders why there are so many Lokis, and as classic Loki explains, because that's what they do. They survive. And they basically state that there's no way back except for a temp pad, which of course they can never get their hands on because nobody from the TVA actually goes to the void. But here we actually find out why Kid Loki is the commander of the group. Loki asks him, why do you wear the horns and you let a child command you? In which classic Loki replies, you'll do well to respect the boy. It's his kingdom and we find out that his nexus event was him killing Thor. Now here we see them walk to their hidden base, and there are a few really cool easter eggs. One, we can see a giant helmet of the evil villain, Yellow Jacket, the villain from the first Ant-Man film. Then we see a super awesome easter egg, the Thanos Copter. The Thanos Copter comes from the very old comic arc, The Cat and the Cosmic Cube, in which Thanos actually uses the Thanos Copter to try and obtain the Cosmic Cube. And he doesn't succeed, he actually gets arrested in handcuffs, which is funny to think about because of how powerful he would go on to be in the comics and in the MCU. Then the Lokis start to go underground and we kind of pan through the dirt in which we see Mjolnir and the frog version of Thor in a jar trying to get Mjolnir. This is known as Throg in the comics. And yes, in the comics, Throg does indeed wield Mjolnir. Now from here, we go back to Sylvie and Renslayer. Renslayer explains the void, and this is where Sylvie has the idea to go beyond the void. Once they go beyond the void, they find the person that created the TVA and kill them together. Renslayer leads Sylvie to believe that she actually does want to take down whoever made the TVA, but at the same time, she calls in reinforcements. But eventually, Sylvie prunes herself to get to the void so she can team up with Loki and try to get past it. We then meet up with the Lokis again, and boastful Loki is going on about how he defeated Captain America and Iron Man. However, Alligator Loki calls him a liar, and he doesn't exactly try to fight with him about the fact. But then we find out that Alligator Loki's Nexus event was eating the wrong neighbor's cat, so he was supposed to eat a neighbor's cat, he just ate the wrong one. They fight for a second, but then here is where we find out something extremely important. Our Lucky was led to believe that he had to go on and die at the hands of Thanos. Thanos chokes him to death and snaps his neck in Infinity War, but this is not what happened for classic Loki. He tells our Loki that their magic potential is a lot more than they think it is, and the daggers that they use actually stunt the potential. His magic was so strong that he cast an illusion so strong that even Thanos, the Mad Titan, believed it. So Thanos thought he killed the real Loki, but it was just an illusion while the other Loki hid. He floated in space for a while, and then landed upon a planet. Eventually, he missed his brother and everybody else and decided to leave the planet, and right when he decided to leave, the TVA showed up. But the big story here is that this Loki did not die by Thanos, and perhaps our Loki didn't die at the hands of Thanos either. Perhaps our Loki did the same thing, cast a very strong illusion. This could have huge implications for the future of the MCU. And you never really know with Marvel, this could have been their plan the entire time. From here, Loki decides that he has to go back to the TVA and he has to get Sylvie. Kid Loki notices that our Loki is a little bit different, but Loki exclaims that it's not him that's different, but it's actually Sylvie. And Loki's plan to get back, since Eliath keeps them there, is to kill Eliath, in which the other Lokis laugh at him. But he decides to leave anyways. Now there's a little cool Easter egg in this scene. There's a Polybius arcade machine in Loki's lair. The Polybius game was an urban legend concerning a fictitious 1980s arcade game. It was a game that was supposedly funded by 
by the government as a crowdsourced psychology experiment. The game supposedly produced intense psychoactive and addictive effects in the player. And this is implying that in the MCU it's real, or at least in some timelines it was. Now as Loki leaves, he is greeted by President Loki and President Loki's posse. Now not all of these people with President Loki are Loki variants because as the other Lokis explain, they've never seen a girl variant of a Loki and there is a girl with President Loki. But it does look like most of them are indeed variants as some variants that we saw in episode two appear here with President Loki. From here, we cut to Sylvie, and she is getting chased by Eliath, but luckily, Mobius is still alive and saves her. And a couple Easter eggs here as they're driving, trying to escape Eliath, we can see a Sphinx, and the Sphinx at one point in time is actually a spaceship that Kang uses to travel through time. It also looks like we can see the Stonehenge on the right side in the same scene, in which you kind of wonder what the Sphinx and the Stonehenge did to end up in the void. Now, back with the Lokis, we find out that boastful Loki actually actually led President Loki and his army to Kid Loki's lair. He did this because he had a deal with President Loki. He would get his army, but of course, Loki being Loki, he betrayed him. And then the other Loki variants being Loki, they betrayed President Loki, in which an all-out war kind of breaks out. Thanks to Alligator Loki biting the hand off of President Loki. But it works out because this is how our Loki, Alligator Loki, Kid Loki, and Classic Loki escape. From here, Classic Loki is pretty pissed. He says, Lokis, we lie, we cheat. And Kid Loki says, and whenever we try to change, we end up here. And this is where Loki says that's why they gotta take down the TVA, and that's why they need the help of Sylvie. So they have to take down Eliath, and the Lokis agree to help. Meanwhile, Mobius and Sylvie reconcile and determine the only way to really press forward and to see who's behind the TVA is to go take down Eliath as well. So they head towards the big cloud. Now, Kid Loki actually has some sort of a device that predicts when the next reset timeline is going to jump into the void, in which they go and they find the 173 USS Eldridge, which has a pretty interesting story in real life. Known as the Philadelphia Experiment, it was a military experiment that claims to have made the ship invisible visible or cloaked to enemy devices. But there was a lot of controversy to this and it was never proven. And it doesn't really bode too well for them in the void either as Eliath comes and quickly destroys them. But then Mobius and Sylvie meet up with our Loki and the other Lokis, in which they come up with their master plan of enchanting Eliath to get past it. Now from here we find out that Hunter B-15 is still alive and being held prisoner. Ravona Renslayer then questions her about Sylvie and here we learn the truth and that is that Renslayer actually wants to know who's behind the TVA as well, leading us to believe that maybe she didn't really know who was in charge. But Hunter B-15 explains that it doesn't matter because Sylvie is going to get to the timekeeper creator before her. But that doesn't stop Renslayer from doing some digging on the founding of the TVA and when it started. Then we go back to the Lokis and Mobius in which we have some very important scenes. One is Mobius talking to Alligator Loki, Classic Loki, and Kid Loki. He claims that when he goes back to the TVA, he wants to tell everybody the truth, and Classic Loki states that he's just going to turn his back on what he devoted his life to, and Mobius drops the bomb, stating that it's never too late to change. And this is something that our Loki and these other Lokis have struggled with. They want to change, but some feel like it's too late. We then have Loki and Sylvie kind of tiptoeing around the fact that they're both in love with each other slash themselves, and we see a little bit of their narcissism coming out when they say that bringing down the TVA is essentially saving the universe. The two of them bond, snuggle a little bit, and promise not to betray each other, stating that Loki has actually changed. And then the two of them basically make plans that when after the TV is gone, they'll kind of go do something together, maybe have their own timeline together, which I think is something that everybody wants at this point. Now from here, the Lokis and Mobius unite. Sylvie is going to go enchant Eliath, and Loki decides to stay with her. Then Kid Loki and Classic Loki decide that they want to stay there in the void as well, because that's their home. That's all they've really known for a long time now. Sylvie and Loki trust Mobius and they give him the temp pad. And Kid Loki gives our Loki his super awesome and looks to be extremely magical dagger, essentially turning Loki into Harry Potter. 
Classic Loki and Kid Loki leave, and we have an insanely good scene between Mobius and Loki where they say goodbye. Mobius says that he's gonna burn the TVA to the ground just like Loki said he was going to do. Mobius reaches for the handshake, but Loki goes in for the hug, calling him his friend, and Mobius says that he was his favorite. He then goes through the tent portal and leaves. And from here we get our final scene. Loki and Sylvie need a branch to happen so that Eliath will focus on it. However, a branch doesn't end up happening in time. Eliath is focused on them, so they need a distraction. Distraction. Loki goes into Harry Potter mode, but isn't exactly the best wizard and can't cause a great enough distraction. However, classic Loki can. And his magic is so outstanding and powerful that he literally creates an illusion of the entirety of Asgard, his home that he once knew. And Eliath takes the bait. Unfortunately, this ends in classic Loki's doom. However, it shows Loki and Sylvie that they're actually a lot stronger than they think they are. And the two of them together, hand in hand, are able to actually enchant Eliath, revealing the castle behind it, which has the person who created the TVA and controls the timeline inside of it. And that's where we're left, and no post credit scene, which was rather odd. Now, a lot of people are saying that this kind of looks like Doom's castle, and I would have to agree. However, do not expect Dr. Doom to show up. Yes, he is an incredibly powerful sorcerer, but remember, this show is about Loki. So it's most likely another variant of Loki or Kang inside of this castle. And as I mentioned in the beginning, be sure to let me know who you think is inside Loki or Kang and be sure to let me know what you would rate this episode of Loki episode 5 from 1 to 10 in the comments down below 10 of course being the highest rating don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the latest Loki videos or MCU news don't forget to like the video and for live updates you can always follow me on Instagram and Twitter as always thank you all so much for watching woof woof